You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 186 is Simon Ratcliffe. He's best known as half of Basement Jacks with his partner Felix Buxton. They've produced seven albums and several EPs since the early mid-90s. You're right now listening to Where's Your Head At from their 2001 album Rooty. Just one of several chart-topping singles, and they've won numerous awards, including Grammys. Simon's most recent project is called Village of the Sun, a collaboration with jazz drummer Moses Boyd and his partner Binker Golding, the saxophonist. We'll look at the song Village of the Sun, recorded in 2016 and just re-released on a full album, First Light. And we'll look back to his 2011 Ratcliffe album, Doris Reicher's EP the song is Flying by the Sun then to the Basement Jacks album Zephyr from 2009 the song is Alcazar and we'll conclude by listening to his very first single Ephemeral released in 1992 under the name Tic Tac Toe for more see basementjacks.com or thevillageofthesun.bandcamp.com for more about this podcast see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com I would love your positive ratings and reviews at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this. Be sure you are subscribed to and reviewing the actual Nakedly Examined Music feed, of course, even if you may be hearing this through Partially Examined Life. And to really show your support, go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. Sign up for a small per-episode donation that will get you an ad-free version of the feed and my detailed episode notes for all the recent episodes. Here we go. So I will have played a little bit of Where's Your Head At by Basement Jacks from Rooty 2001. Just to orient folks, of course, there are several of those big dance hits that we could use for that purpose. This seemed to be the one with the most downloads. And I want to get this out there to, by contrast to what we're about to hear of your current work, the dance tracks often built on samples. The Where's Your Head At was built on this Gary Newman sample, bringing in guest vocalists. Can you... Say a little about this transition between that stuff that you've done in various different forms for years and years to what's going on Village in the Sun before we listen to that track. Well, I suppose um, the music that I did with Felix, both of us have always had very eclectic tastes and we've always incorporated that into our music. And when we met each other, the music that we were doing, this is 94, 93, when we put our first EP out, it was kind of very influenced, we're trying to sound like American New York, Chicago, house music, which in itself was influenced by a lot of Latin music, as well as African, of course, and jazz and disco, all the kind of subgenres around that, you know. We would have usually on our the EPs that we self-released as Basement Jacks, this is before we kind of signed to a big label and had tracks in the charts. This is when we were making music for DJs. There would be four track EPs, and usually there'd be one on there that was a vocal song, one that was just a good pumping DJ track, and then maybe one ambient one, and one that was even more left field. You know, we kind of, we, they were like mini albums we always saw those EPs as. And it was, we were trying to just express like, yeah, this is possible, this is possible, we're into all kinds of music, and so are other people, and we were always just quite sort of a, a broad palette that we were picking from. It just got broader and broader as you went on. Yeah, we always did it. Then, so it's not news. To, what I'm trying to say is that so jazz influences to my God, I've done a you know something jazz. I'm kind of keen to to do anything really. In a minute, we'll play the uh, the title track, the eponymous track, the, the track called "The Village of the Sun," the longest track from this album. Seems to be getting actually already, even though it just went up on Spotify. It's like has quite a few more downloads than the other tracks on there. So I guess this was a good pick. Can you give us a, a picture of, so it's you and this Moses Boyd, this drummer, Binker Golding, the saxophone player. The first two tracks we did for this were in 2016, and that was Village of the Sun and another track called Ted, which is also on the album. I was actually looking for a drummer. That's initially, that's what I was looking for. It was a follow-on from a previous project I'd done, which kind of delved into the world of jazz fusion and electronica. And I was trying to come up with some hybrid of my own where I was able to like use my knowledge of electronics but also enjoy the kind of the life and the sort of dynamics of the musicality of jazz and jazz fusion and just try to 
liven things up a bit. A new experiment, really. It was just a side project. I did that. That was called Ratcliffe, my name, and then Doris Rikers. And I thought I wanted to do a follow-up to that. And I need a, a, a drummer because uh, things for me often start with the drums. If you have your drums, uh, not just what they're playing, but like the sonics of them and the space that they occupy, it kind of sets you up. I find it easy to kind of lay stuff on top of it. So this is, as you say, the first recording, Village of the Sun, that you did with them in 2016 from this recently re- released uh, 2022 First Light album. It's rather long. <laughs> it seems like most of these songs have some sort of recurring riff, maybe just two chords that it's going between that just passes. And so we've got that in here, but it takes a while to establish itself. And then it really cooks for a few minutes and then it kind of peters down and you have plenty of room for your saxophonist to leave the key and fly around a bit. But, you know, it's a good seven minutes of journey over this very mantra-like riff. Any, do you have any other just words of introduction before we hear it? You've described it very, very well. It was the first track that we did and it sort of set the tone and it established a good working relationship between me and Binka and Moses. And we wanted it to be exactly, let's have a, the riff. We like the riff. Let's find a motif. I just, on the spur of the moment, sang the initial thing, da, 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 the sax line. I suggested to mm-hmm. Binka that he starts with that and then take it wherever you see fit. Let's see if it can crescendo and then die down a bit. And we did about two, three takes. One was slightly longer, one was slightly shorter. And uh, like Goldilocks, I think we went for the, the one that was just right, the one in between. Hopefully it leaves you feeling warm and enriched somehow.
let's talk mechanically about this. Were the two guys playing against the riff? Were you playing that live along with them? That riff, that keyboard riff, which sounds a bit almost like a steel pan or something, or a, yeah, it's a keyboard riff that I liked. I didn't know what it was for. I thought it might be an ambient track. It's one of the things I had here in my, my room at home. I thought it might be good for another EP to develop somehow. And I had a couple of other ideas, and I was looking to do another solo project, which is pure self-indulgent for fun, to kind of like be free with my imagination. And I thought, I must find a drummer. And around that time, we're talking around 2014, 2015, I'd come to know Binka and Moses, who had won a, a Jazz Mobo Award here and some other awards, I think. And they were, people were very excited about them because what was actually quite unique about them, very kind of um, attracting and interesting, was that it was just the two of them. So they would play together, but there was no double bass and no keyboards. So they would play just drums and sax. And it was a very raw sound. They obviously could read each other very well and sort of, yeah, really impressive. I had just released and produced an EP by a Czech sort of art prog jazz trio called NTS Trio. Don't ask me how I met them, but that's another story. But I met them and we'd released some music of theirs and I wanted them to do a gig in London. No, first of all, I wanted a label to put their stuff out on. And where I worked, our headquarters at that time, the Basement Jacks headquarters in North London, was just across the way from this jazz label called Gearbox Records. And I went and approached Daryl at Gearbox and asked if he'd be interested in releasing this. And he was. So he put out this 7-inch by NTS Trio from Prague. And Gearbox, as it happened, was the label that Binker and Moses were on. So he was like, you know, looking after them and sort of overseeing their career to some degree and uh, was a huge supporter of theirs. So when it came time to me trying to get this trio to do a gig, I'm not a promoter. I've never put on gigs before, but I wanted, I just was a fan. I just thought they're amazing musicians. And I was like, oh, it'd be great for you to do a gig over here. So I got them over. They slept in the studio. I got uh, air mattresses and went and bought like duvets and sleeping bags so they could sleep in the studio. (laughs) because instead of paying for a hotel, but they were happy, it was all good. And they came and they did this show. So basically, I yeah, he suggested, well, we could put on a show and Binker and Moses, who are known in the jazz world, as opposed to this Czech trio I had who weren't known. So if we put the two together, it's got a bit more weight to it. We might be able to attract more people. And Binker and Moses agreed to do it, which is great. It was in London, in Dalston, and we put a night on that was great. I'm not a concert promoter and it's, yeah, suddenly I was in this position of trying to get people to come to this show, which I don't ever want to have to do again. That is not my bag at all, I've discovered. But yeah, because I wanted it to, I didn't want it to be empty. I wanted it to, you know, to be reasonably happening. But anyway, it was a good night. It was all really good. So that was my first meeting with Binker and Moses. So a year passes or so and I'm thinking of this project of my own and I want a drummer and I'm thinking of Moses Boyd, who's an amazing drummer. And I hadn't really thought about sax, to be honest. And I thought maybe, I didn't know what kind of style it would be. I was thinking it might be more fusion-y. But then as time passed, I thought, well, maybe I wonder if Binker would be interested. I wonder if we could get sax. Maybe the two of them would be interested in doing something. Again, not really thinking of a style of music. You know, you were asking me, how did we come to this style of music, what it is now? It sort of was dictated just by how they play and in a way the chords were and sort of led... Well, so they said yes. We got into the studio and we're there and I have some chord sequences and like that one that you've just played, Village of the Sun. Yeah, mantra-like is a good description. Obvious, quick associations, Alice Coltrane, Ferris Sanders, all that sort of vibe, you know, maybe spiritual jazz, they call it. And that seemed to, I don't know, just sort of sit well with it. You know, it could have gone another way. It could have become, I mean, those chords could have gone into maybe a, a deep house track, you know, in a way. But with Binker there, I thought... He's there on the other side of the glass, and I'm thinking, yeah, we need a motif. I think it helps to have a motif, something you can jump, start with, like in a way, like something concrete that you start with for him to then jump off. And then if he wants to, jump back onto again to kind of conclude the whole experience. So, yeah, I just like top of my head went da 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 which is one of the first kind of main things he plays. And then he went off, and like I said, we did like maybe two takes, maybe three takes, just like that. Should we try a bit shorter? Should we try a bit longer? Maybe try and climax a bit earlier, you know? Very just general discussion like that. And it was great. I mean, it was so exciting. Was there a digital heartbeat under this, such that he was actually listening to a metronome so that you could sequence to it later? 
I had a click and I was like, would, is that going to, yeah, I felt sort of conscious of like, you know, I'm sorry, because that's not very jazz. Do you know what I mean? I, they, do they, but they were fine. They were very professional. They're okay. cool. So Moses played along to the click. A lot of times, though, where they're playing, I doubt he could hear the click because it would have got buried because they got more and more intense. But they'd find their way back and it just about all sort of held together, not with themselves, but in how they were playing, you know, the fact that they were playing over this chord sequence. Those chords that you hear at the beginning of the recording, that is all there was. There was nothing else. There was no bass. There was no other keyboards, no decor. It was literally just that chord pattern going round and round and round ad infinitum. So, yeah, and I had them playing over that three takes worth. And then we did another track called Ted, which was a chord sequence that I took from uh, Ted Moses, who's a Canadian jazz musician. Actually, I should make note, there's a, I think it's called Dreamship. It's a Ted Moses quintet, I think. It popped up on my YouTube one day, and it's from a YouTuber called uh, A Jazz Man Dean. So I want to give a shout out to him. I should get in touch with him, actually. Because in a way, he's responsible, because I think Ted was the first thing that I thought of doing with Binker and Moses, not Village of the Sun. And it was this chord sequence that I thought was beautiful. And I replayed it, I listened to it, and sort of like approximated it. I got it as close as I could. And then I transposed it. And I was going to change it. I thought, oh, I'll take that idea, but I'll just change it. But it was so good, I didn't end up changing it. I, I just kept it as it was, and then asked Binker and Moses to play on top of it. And Ted Moses, by the way, is credited. He's an author on the track, because it's his chord sequence. And it's called Ted, because it's totally acknowledged. It's called Ted, because he's Ted Moses. The track Dreamship, you should listen to. It's really, really good. It's beautiful. But it has more changes. So I just took that chord sequence and they played over that. This is kind of all getting to a very unique approach that I can't think of another instance of somebody who is a fan of jazz, who thinks in terms of jazz chords, who knows a lot about jazz. You know, you're not yourself, correct me if I'm wrong, right? You didn't like start as a, a Thelonious Monk influenced jazz pianist. Like you don't go out there. So you get to, you know, be around these incredible jazz players but you don't actually have to do what they do, that you can complement them with your own style and be the producer and the, the foundation layer and the layerer and you know the set dresser and everything. I did some editing on some tracks. I think Village of the Sun, I didn't touch it. I had to do a bit of tweaking on Ted when it sometimes it veered out of time quite a lot that you only notice. Together, they're great. It's just with my backing track, I had to do a bit of chopping there. And there was one track where I had to edit between, I didn't have to, but I, yeah, they were quite different takes. I think it was Tigris, where um, we did three or four takes, and they varied quite a lot in their content, and I preferred that bit from that one, and that bit from that one, and that, so I did a lot. But it's quite tricky, because they play in the same room, Binker and Moses, so the sax mic's picking up the drums. Yeah, you can't just tweak a kick drum. Well, actually, maybe a kick drum, because it's sonically isolated enough, but... yeah. But the drums are picking up the sax, the sax is picking up the drums. So you might get, you might want to go to this sax bit, but if you do that, the whole tonality of the drums, you're going to notice in the background or there, there'll be some weird phasing issues or you're limited as to what you can do. But limits are quite good. I like that. It's, you know, it can sometimes force you just to be more creative. Were they resistant to having like a piece of glass between them? <laughs> if you were in a studio and putting the drums in the drum isolation room so you could see or... That's just not how they work. They look at each other and they're kind of, that's just how they, that's how they do it. The studio we were in only had one room, so they wouldn't have been. I suppose Binker could have played in the control room, but that's just not their vibe, you know. They play together. So, and that's how they record their albums, you know. So, which is amazing. And their albums are great. I wasn't going to um, suggest they change one thing about what they do, you know. So, in terms of the things that you added, in addition to the synths that you're doing your portamento, there's a place where it launches to the stratosphere. I wrote, you know, that, that you've got these, these swooshing sounds and things. And even layering, you know, it sounds like when that your initial riff comes in, it sounds like electric piano, but then you add a steel drum patch to it. Is that one of the pieces of your toolkit is like, let's just tweak the actual sound of the patch as it moves forward so that even though it's repeating, the patch is velocity mm -hmm. sensitive. And with more velocity, I think that steelness, the steel panness comes out. Okay. 
I think for the most part, it's the same thing playing, but it's just at different velocities and different em- so different emphases. I might have played an octave with it at one point. I think when it gets more intense, an octave comes in of the same thing. Mm-hmm. This sort of snaky percussion. Did you have Miles come in again and do a couple overdubs, or did you, or is that all you, or is that just part of his kit? Moses did that, I think. Yeah, Moses had some percussion with him. I'm pretty sure he did that, but I did some as well when I wanted some. I had I overdubbed some later, but he does that anyway, like while playing the kit, because he's you know you can hear there's ride cymbal going, but then there's also this shaking of. There are two sessions basically. So the tracks "Village of the Sun" and "Ted" they were recorded in 20. 20- 16 Mm -hmm. and then gearbox didn't release them because they had a backlog of stuff and didn't come out till 2019 and then it was during the lockdown in 2020 where i think daryl might have asked do you want to do some more that thing's great what you did the single that came out so it was then that we corresponded to see if they'd be up for doing some more so basically after the here in england we had our first break from lockdown was October 20, 2020. And so we took the opportunity to go and st- you were allowed to go out for work purposes. You still weren't allowed to do anything particularly normal, but you're allowed to go out. So we, b- we booked a studio. They hadn't been playing all that time. So for him, it was an excuse to play, you know. So I said, well, I've got some more ideas. We went and did a session. And that, in a way, that's one reason why the album's called First Light, because it was like, it felt like, oh, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Mm-hmm. And we were recording, the studio where we were recording, there's a cafe around the corner, which is, serves the studio complex. And there were people there in like hazmat suits, you know, kind of because someone had been detected with COVID there. It was like, yeah, seen from, I don't know, sci- science fiction. They had like hazmat suits and the full mask things and they were hosing the place down. So it was still like a high alert. Everyone was like, didn't quite know what this COVID was. And it was still this feared kind of, deadly entity you know Mm -hmm. so that was sort of there in the background so we were legally we were like permitted to exit our houses and go and do something if it was for work purposes and if everyone had done a test blah 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 so yeah we all were very happy just to be in a room with other human beings again and we got on with it and we were yeah in the space of seven hours we did five tracks more than five so i had five ideas and they probably did two or three takes of each one some of that was overdubbing percussion to the stuff you'd done a couple years earlier or or the village of the sun was just done the village of the sun was done sorry the reason i jumped to this was because i remember clearly uh, moses overdubbing stuff that second session Mm, mm -hmm. that we would do a take and he'd go oh shall i do some overdubs oh yeah that'd be great and he'd get his stuff out listen to himself listen to the take and do stuff on top i know that happened so that was for the other tracks but for village of the sun i can't honestly remember if he didn't do it then i would have done it just like sprinkle some decorations on it Let's stop for some sponsor talk. It is the best time of year to order something for a loved one that is a thoughtful gift for them, but doesn't require you hauling your butt to a store or even uh, fishing around Amazon for 15 hours. And you can order it right at the last minute. I'm talking about Masterclass, where you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders anytime, anywhere at your own pace. Perhaps you or your loved one would like to hear about intentional eating with Michael Pollan. Modeling with Naomi Campbell. Disruptive Entrepreneurship with Richard Branson. And this is apart from all the great classes in the arts, whether comedy or film, short stories, and of course, music. Why Masterclass has 2023 Grammy nominees, John Legend, Christina Aguilera, Hans Zimmer, Questlove, and Danny Elfman. There are over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors. There will definitely be... Many things on here your loved ones will appreciate. And the thing you have always wanted to do is closer than you think. A new one I was looking at is crypto and the blockchain. Because I'm an old person. I don't understand what any of this stuff is about. And so this class brings together several different instructors, including three different uh, leaders of crypto companies and Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman to explain what this is. And what the controversies are surrounding it. Should you figure out how to make NFTs out of your music? This series may help you determine whether that's something you should look into. Every class is available in audio or video. Play it at your desired speed. They look really beautiful. You could make it a TV experience or make it more of a podcast experience. You could get through a whole class. You could just take little bits of many classes. So it's very low commitment. There are supplementary materials 
like sheet music with the music classes often, and a whole community you can interact with. You can use it on just about any digital device you want. I highly recommend you check it out. This holiday, give the perfect gift of an annual Masterclass membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash examined today. That's masterclass.com slash examined. Terms apply. Let's talk about showering. I'm just getting over a bout of COVID and with my raw, scratchy throat standing in the shower, specifically standing in this Nebbia by Moen Quattro shower with its drenching, misty experience has been the high point of the day, a source of great relief in a dry-throated time. The Nebbia by Moen Quattro showerhead is an innovation by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers who spent years researching and developing a superior shower experience that saves water with a mere three minute installation. That's as easy as changing a light bulb. You can upgrade your showering experience and save 40 to 50% of water compared to a traditional shower. It's the holidays. It is a perfect time for making the life of a loved one or yourself a little bit better. This Nebbia by Moen showerhead is available in five beautiful finishes to match your bathroom. And they offer other sustainable bathroom accessories, such as their new quick dry earth mat, shower shelves, shower curtains, hooks, bath mats, and more. So a great time to upgrade your bathroom and a great time to save the planet. Nebbia and Moen have the joint goal to save 1 billion gallons of water by 2023. You can be a part of it. Nebbia by Moen Quattro starts at just $119 exclusively on Nebbia.com. Nebbia gave us a special discount just for our community. Go to Nebbia.com slash N-E-M. Use the code N-E-M at checkout to get 10% off all Nebbia products. Again, go to Nebbia.com slash N-E-M. That's N-E-B-I-A dot com slash N-E-M to check out what they have to offer and save 10% with the code N-E-M. Let's get the second song out there. I definitely could drill into some details in this one, but let's we'll do it on the second one here. Flying by the sun from that precursor project to this, the Doris Rikers EP 2011 credited to Ratcliffe. I feel like we've already introduced this project. Say a little more about it, then we'll hear the song. It's only four and a half minutes. It's not an epic like the last one, but there's a lot packed into it. This is very layered. This is the beginning of my foray. I had some downtime from Basement Jacks, my day job, and I wanted to kind of just delve into the world of influences, like I said before, using what I knew how to work, the things I'd learned about electronic music, but also my loves about the uh, intricacies and the energy of, I don't know, I don't know to pigeonhole it, but fusion-esque music or jazz and rock and jazz rock and all that stuff. And so this was my first attempt to do that. It was an EP and this one is my favorite. It's called Flying by the Sun. The sun's definitely, there seems to be a sun thing going on. It's not deliberate, but maybe... um It has some deeper meaning somewhere.
All right, so just that rhythmic bed at the beginning. I'm counting like three different layers of drums. You've got your tom heavy thing. You've got your sort of mid-range metallic banging. And then you've got this sort of bird chirping. Can you say a little about how you're picking your sound palettes? Does the bird chirping not come in until you've already worked on this for 12 hours? I mean, it was in 2011. I probably recorded it. So it's quite a while ago. I can't remember exactly, but I can tell for a fact that that intro is the music. I've pitched it down an octave. And so with that, you get other, you get harmonics that come out and other kind of resonances come out. So that might sound like bird chirping, but it might be, I don't know, you'd have to speed up. If you pitch that up 12, you might find that that bird chirping is actually a symbol or something, you know, Mm. or it might be a bird chirping. (laughs) It might be a bird chirping. I assumed it was some digital, some patches. I know you're not going to remember the details of exactly how you picked what thing, but in terms of your general, like, do you spend time just leafing through patch libraries to you know and labeling stuff like "Ah, i should use that at some point or how do these things are some pieces of this lying around from years ago or some of it is yeah sure got lots of instruments you know and you have you know samples and sounds on keys you know but i wish i was more organized especially with synthesizers and patches you know if i could just be just organized say these suits like ambient film music these suits uh, you know energetic dance it's like every time it's starting from scratch which is really annoying so you're spending a whole day just walking through patches trying to figure out. Yeah, not organized at all. You know, like that bird chirp, that might be something electronic that's then been pitched down. Because some of the samples, obviously, there'll be, you know, some of them are musical samples, but some of them will be the sounds of a squeaking wheel or something recorded from TV or so. I don't know where they've all come from. I think I would have layered it for ambience, a bit like, you know, the shaking in Village of the Sun and like, which both Moses and I did, you know, just is part of a lot of jazz music. You know, it's very atmospheric and using instruments to create just a texture before any clear rhythms actually kicked in. So I kind of use electronic sounds in the same, well, not just me, but electronic sounds are used in the same way, just like decoration and atmosphere, setting a picture in a way. So um, the bird chirp, I'm not sure exactly what it is. And the drums for this are Nathan Curran, uh, who goes by, also known as Tug, the drummer who's uh, someone I've known for a very long time. He played with the Basement Jacks. He's been our onstage live drummer for, well, since, I don't know when, long, long, long time, 2003. Uh, he played on the track Good Luck, which was a big tune of ours from, again, 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. He has his own project called Planet Batagon, which is like electronic jazz. And he played on this track. I recorded, like I said, for me, it always starts with the drums. The sound of the drums in any track, they really set the scene tuning of them and the room they're in and the tone of them for me someone like me who's kind of artificially putting music on top it gives it an authenticity and and a vibe an immediate vibe what they're playing is important but just their presence and their sound is really really important i didn't want to do electronic drums just purely electronic drums Mm -hmm. wanted to get that life that you get from real drums so like on this project i went to nathan and he did a great he played on two tracks on this ep the doris rikers ep and then for Village of the Sun, like I said before, the first person I thought of was Moses because he was a drummer I'd recently got to know. So so when Nathan puts his part down, what is he listening to exactly? Like, do you at least have the bass line and that bump? In this one, there's a couple changes, you know, so we got a definite B section. We're now on a different chord. Is that stuff mapped out before he gets his? Yeah. Okay. So he's actually setting the atmosphere that inspires you to do like, oh, let's do this change at this point. I can't remember what he would have because listening to it yeah it really goes up a notch and it it wouldn't have been any kind of key change or any kind of I think it would have been maybe do one take mellow and do one take more ferocious I mean he plays hard Nathan he he beats the drums I don't think it was even that structured and I don't think even I had an idea of how it would go I can't remember what the backing track was that he was listening to I think it was just getting takes of a different nature of a different velocity and different dynamic, and then me listening to them and going, okay, well, I can use that. That's good for that bit. And then when I worked out that I wanted it to go there, I go, oh, well, maybe these would work there. I think that's how I pieced it together. Well, and I'm always interested in the legalities of who gets songwriting credit. That if you start a whole thing, it's basically a drum jam that you've said, this is the tempo, play this long, and then I will use that to create an edifice. Does that mean that he gets co-writing credit because he was the first? Normally, drummers don't get that. <laughs> No, I know. And maybe you're right, you know. I mean, what happens when people improvise on each other's records? Like if a jazz musician plays on another one, do they get 
writing credits for their solo. I don't think, I think it's the chord progression and the melody that that's the only thing you can copyright. And so it really is just up to the individual, like what their setup is. Some of them just have like, yeah. Oh, well, whoever's in the room when we record it, they get it. You know, everybody, everybody gets co-writing credit or it's usually much administratively simpler not to do that. Just <laughs> pay them a session fee. Obviously, I was financially uh, decent <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Nathan. But I mean, if this was the title track to a Netflix uh, series now, I would definitely be looking after Nathan. You know, I think I owe you a bit more. That, alas, did not come to pass. <laughs> So about 25 seconds in. There's something that's not in the original chord. You know, the chord is just hitting at the end of four. So it gives you a lot of room there. But I don't know. Do you think in terms of modes or any of that music theory stuff in terms of I'm going to do something that's completely because it just sounds like you know you're playing a different scale you're playing a different this down now 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 which is I forget is that guitar I'm that's a synthesized sound I don't know to me it sounded Turkish yes later in the song you have a guitar solo you know that peaks out but yeah any thoughts about do you recall in terms of your decision making in okay we need to have something like it's a standard jazz thing and it happens in Village of the Sun after a while, but you know, you've got this drone. What is a creative saxophone player going to do over a drone? They're going to leave the key. <laughs> he plays his riff, but then, well, he's going to jump up. He's going to play it in five different places. So that's a standard jazz thing. I mean, is that sort of where this gesture in the purely electronic realm is coming from as well? That I'm going to introduce some sonically different element to just add harmonic complexity. There was not a conscious effort, not in any kind of music theory way. Anything that I did was purely like, this is what it needs here. This melody seems right. This tone suggests this to me. Or this sound, I'm getting a sound up. Oh, this sound sounds kind of a bit Middle Eastern or a bit Turkish. So that kind of, oh, yeah, that's nice. Let's not do an obvious, let's try and do, I don't know what that scale's called. You probably know the term. but I don't know the names of the scales. I never actually, I could sit down and figure them out. Yes. Mixolodian and whatever, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's all done purely by feel. This is what it needs. And the sounds suggest, keyboard sounds, everything, the tone of things, they suggest what you should do with them, I think. A little after that, this tremolo stereo lead guitar, 38 seconds. Here's our head. We're going to introduce the... Nah, 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 nah. You already have the rhythmic bass down. You've already come up with the keyboard stuff. How am I going to elaborate it? Or because this sounds like a starting point, a melody, but I'm guessing this probably came later. I don't know when that came. I know that I had it turned up really loud. This is one of the studios we had. And I used to be there till very late at night and I had it really loud and I was loving it. It's just, just one of the best experiences. The hairs in the back of my neck. I was with an imaginary band in a way. I was like, yeah, this is, I love this music. I don't know what it is, but this is the band I want to see. And it was just blaring out. And I picked up a guitar and just, what would I do now if it was my time to play in this band? And I played that. So it's just me just having a lot of fun, really. I thought, okay, that would be cool. And I just recorded it and that was it, really. So I sort of grew up on guitar music, really. That's my sort of background from when I was young and, and like a lot of my influences and stuff. My life since I was 22 years old has been electronic music. And there's been bits of guitar in there and I'd play guitar on stage. But real proper like rock guitar world has kind of like been... It's on the other side of the fence in a way, you know, don't often get a chance to go there. So with this, I was totally just, yeah, really being myself in a way. So I did this at the time, and this is a four track EP, but I've rediscovered this track, which is why I asked you or sent it to you, because I just, I think it stood the test of time. It was, I made it in 2011, 2010, 2011. And uh, for this Village of the Sun, I did a little DJ set yesterday and just been asked to just do a few little sets of music and so i've been going back on my past and i thought i wonder what that ep's like and this track in particular it's not perfect still not perfect i mean the sonics of it it could be far better now i'd like to do it again if i could find the, the files i'd love to mix it again it's just a bit too kind of like dirty you know i mean it's good being dirty that's the energy but there are some aspects that sound a bit amateur to me but i remember playing that guitar part and i just remember the pure joy and when you do that and you're creating an element that's going to repeat, I mean, did you pretty much just play the riff once and then you just cut and paste it and or were you like, I'm going to play the song all the way through? Like I would have played throughout, but then probably I would have 
cut and pasted the best take or the best couple of takes probably yeah sounds like there's two guitars in there isn't there it's like double tracks isn't it i think so tremolo with a pick on a guitar it's not an easy technique in the first place i don't know if it's tremolo is it is it tremolo but yeah i'm just sort of playing it really fast yeah uh, i just did a for our listeners i just did a <laughs> we're air guitaring a here. mime uh, i did a mime of how yeah Let's move forward just a little bit further. So you got some nice kind of 70s portamento synth solo here, 104. And this goes on for quite a while. So is this played? Is this jammed? Or is this programmed or a combination? I mean, mm-hmm. if I mess up, I correct it. And there are some things which are technically impossible. There are some things where the syncopation is so deliberately quantized or deliberately, you know, but I take joy in that. It's like, I want it to be George Duke, but who's kind of like a cyborg George Duke. Do you know what I mean? Like guitar wise, people like Zappa are kind of like a big influence on me. Well, influence on me, people I like. And then people like George Duke, his synth sounds and that, yeah, it really gets me going. And with this, I think that sound actually, I think it's a bass, synthesized bass sound, but just played high up. Ah, okay. It's very unfashionable. I think it's a shame, really, that, I don't know, in mainstream music, it's kind of instrumentation and expression with instrumentation and, like, for quite long periods of time. It's just not very fashionable, you know. I think it was in the 70s, wasn't it? But Well, and portamento, what I mean by that for folks is synth sounds that blur from one note to another. Like, that was a definite point in the early 70s, you know, through Weather Report and those folks like that are, you know, that has not really come back that I'm aware of. But it's very cool. In fact, yeah, so let me just play a little further. 143, I guess this is where it gets sequenced. That you've been soloing along and now it's the 16th note thing. Or is that still played as far as you're aware? I've done it for the idea. Mm -hmm. And then I go, okay, well... I can either try and make it sound natural or I can just be, just go, no, no, let's make it computerized. And I just made it really, really sort of straight. I mean, hearing that, it's for me like a feeling maybe 60s, 70s. Sure, Sun Ra or Bitches Brew. Maybe less atonal than that, maybe more structured than that, you know. Mm. But I'm just thinking I would like to do another one now, going back to what you're playing now, going back to what I did there. Yeah, just doing something, another musical indulgence but that's got that sort of energy to it and bringing more of the guitars in and stuff. And anyway, sorry, you just got me going thinking. Well, and I didn't really notice on this EP whether you combined, you know, having a really good traditional jazz soloist come in with then you're going to bring in your highly produced solo that you patched together, your jazz cheat, (laughs) as we were calling it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In Village of the Sun, you've got these two live jazz musicians playing off each other sort of against the thing and you've got your role but then if you want to be no no i'm a soloist too here i'm going to insert my portamento solo in the middle of that oh in village of the sun i'd be no my it's not i'm not worthy no 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 okay (laughs) that's the very interesting but in village of the sun i'm really like they're so good i mean they're such amazing musicians and they've got such a feel really their own sound and their own understanding that i'm there to compliment it sort of bathes it in a way, you know, it kind of uh, colors it and helps to structure it and shape it. But I wouldn't, no, that would be just very inappropriate for me to kind of get involved. I think it'd be rude and and ignorant. <laughs> the B section here, this is 221 from Flying by the Sun here. With that bass led thing, and I assume it's the same patch that it's playing the bass part, but then it goes, beep, beep, you know, the, does the sort of DJ that they, you're just, you know, jumping up five octaves or whatever. <laughs> it's just with the pitch band, putting the pitch band on plus 36 or something, and then just oh, oh okay, so, wiggling, wiggling it. All right. So this is not all in post. This is. Yeah. Yeah. So just quickly wiggling it up and down. Yeah. And then you got a nice, just after that, a harp sample that comes in. Let me just play that. that you've got this bananas riff that's going and let's introduce a just this nice little again at that point i felt like i don't want it to go too aggressive i want to keep a soulfulness to it and a sort of a femininity to it it's a harp sound but i've just played it i mean again i think that's just going up and down the black keys 
mm. which always sound nice. What is the scale of the Black Keys? Do you know? That's a scale. Oh, okay. I thought that might even be a sample of like, let's just get the glissando harp. It could be, no, but that I definitely just went up and down the Black Keys on a harp sound. And yeah, it just gives a nice contrast, I think. Of course, I wanted to do something for Basement Jacks here. I had assumed like, oh, let's do something off the most recent album. And you express, you know, do Zephyr. Do the one before that, 2009, which I actually like that album a lot better too. And one of the ones you suggested was Alcazar. Very guitar heavy acoustic guitar thing a lot of sort of latin flavor to the the rhythms or middle eastern you know yeah can you say a little about where you guys were at with this album and with this track in particular before we hear it? so it's 2008 2009 and we went to berlin and we worked in a studio we rented a studio for two weeks we had a great time we just uh, invited as many people as we could think into the studio one of them was turkish guy who i think played the oud i think i might have that wrong Another guy, a classical guitarist who plays on this. There's a Middle Eastern drum. I, I figured this was a guest guitarist, but then after what you just said about the previous song, I thought, oh, maybe this is Simon after all. But no, okay, this is a... <laughs> no, no, this is a guest guitarist who I think came up with that, or maybe we, I don't know, if we. Should, I can't remember exactly how it came about. I think we had the gist of this done in Berlin, and then we brought it back to London and finished it. This album called Zephyr, we had an album called Scars, which is our, I think that's our fourth or fifth album. And then we had all this other stuff that was more ambient, I suppose, and definitely not uh, what a lot of people would associate with Basement Jacks in that it wasn't kind of like dance or dance pop or whatever or house. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, looking back on it, I kind of wish we'd just... So this this album, Zephyr, was supposed to be like a co... the sort of quieter sibling of Scars, the main album. I heard it was supposed to be a double album initially that you were going to just actually... You know, it's the two sides of Basement Jacks or whatever, but, you know, so this is the the second side. (laughs) I kind of wish we just released this and say this is it, because it was kind of more honest already. I mean, it was maybe not what everyone wanted to hear, but again, I do think this is, for the most part, it's really stood the test of time. I listen to it a lot still, and yeah, it was us just being honest and doing stuff that made us feel good. And less than four minutes.
All right, so you got your main riff here, this acoustic guitar thing with the very Latin underpinnings. Is that what came first here? And all the, do you remember what the order operations was that, for this was? No, I remember not enough at all. I'm trying to remember the name of the, of the percussive instrument that the guy's playing. He was either Moroccan or Turkish. And it's probably on the, on the album credits there, where it should be. We can use this if you don't remember the details of that, about this particular track, just to talk sort of in general about, you're talking about getting all these guests in here. And I mean, I even had a question just about when you have a singer songwriter that you're working with, is it usually the case that, well, you've got the song pretty much written, but you give the singer a chance to tweak the lyrics or whatever, or is it often the case that, well, it's kind of their song actually that they brought in and that you're then creating a thing around it. Have you done both of those or is it usually one or the other? Uh, the only time that that's really happened where we're working on an existing song is when we've done a remix and it's already a record and we're just doing an, a, a version of it. But otherwise, let me see, the early days, like the 90s, album one, album two, we would always have the song written before they came in. And then we would try various people on it and keep trying people until we found the right one. We work with some professional singers, but we also work with a lot of singers who weren't, yeah, they weren't singers. They were just people who had a particular vibe about them. And we thought they'd be good to try out. And the songs were a lot simpler then as well, of course. You know, a lot of the, the songs that we're known for, well, like the early songs, it's only really like four lines or something and then a chorus and then maybe a little bridge. They're not really big songs. Word-wise, there's not a lot of words in them. Right, whereas if you get a rapper in and the rapper <laughs> says 100 words per five seconds, you know, through the song, like probably they get to write that and you give them credit for that. Is that... Well, Jump and Shout, that's a big tune of ours. It's on Rem the Remedy album, Slaughter John, they're his words. I think we suggested that Jump and Shout, that he say Jump and Shout, or maybe he said jump and shout, and then we said, oh, that should be repeated, that should be the chorus. I don't think he had it, but the rest of it, that's totally his style. That And the way he does it, the start, that was all his... Yeah, so that's a good example of when someone did bring in something. So just using that to get back to Alcazar, you know, we actually have lyrics near the beginning of this. It almost sounded like, what is this, a sample of like Greg Lake singing from 1973? Or is this you singing these words in this, you know, first part of this song? And so we came from not so far away. That's Felix singing. Oh, okay. They're his words and that's him singing it. Okay. Cause it's strangely not, it sounds like a sample cause it's, it's, you know, the way it is embedded with a lot of noises and things, but it's not like singing over it in a rhythmic way. <laughs> you know, it's, he might have sung that when the guitar is played, hmm. th those chords, he might have sung it then as an idea for a song to go on top of it. Okay. The original idea might have been that we had a song. Those were the chords. And then that was going to be the song on top of it. But then in, in the end, we ended up using it as an introduction. So I think that might be what Right, because the happened. song itself, you just let it be a guitar instrumental that then passes on to a whistling with a lot of weird effects on it so that I'm coming up with a melody. I could make it in words. You know what? Whistling is fine. Let's just add some delay and chorus or whatever, whatever you did to thicken the whistling. Yeah, well, often words aren't needed. And perhaps at this point, we weren't trying to write songs anymore. We were happy to have just enjoy the music and, uh, and see where that took us. Let me play a little bit from about uh, 135. I wrote warped guitar solo. So I didn't know if this was you or this was your guest here. So he's continuing his very prominent acoustic thing, but then you have that, wah, 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 which I think that's me on an acoustic guitar, on a steel string acoustic guitar, and then it's got a, a pitch shifter on it and a formant changer. Like a wah wah, like it's changing the tone, or what was it? So pitch is just the pitch, the note you're at, you know, and but the sure. formant is like is like the tone. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know technically how to describe it. Anyone listening probably can. Yeah, what does it say? What's the definition of a formant? F-O-R-M-A-N-T. For example, I think a woman has a higher formant tone than a man. It's not necessarily the pitch. The bands of frequency that determine the, the phonetic quality of a vowel. That doesn't sound... There you go. Exactly. What, what, yeah, the that's broad right. spectral, spectral maximum that results from an acoustic resonance of the human vocal tract. It sounds like a wah-wah. Is, is what is it to me? I'm pretty sure it's me playing that on the acoustic guitar and then I'm changing the format after the recording. Is this, I assume, still Felix when we actually get to the chanting part? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's Phoenix. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's just a very colorful outro in terms of like, let's just add these XOL noises and little kisses or splatters of you're taking noise of an audience and moving it around the stereo space and things just to, to get us to the end here. Yeah. Any thought about your methodology and like the audience noise in particular? Like, I honestly, I can't remember the audience noise. Maybe it was just there. Maybe it felt like, I don't know. That's what you want to hear. I mean, sure. Well, I mean, that in particular connotes the, the guitar solo is just played. Let's bring in a pre recorded audience noise to clap about how good the guitar solo was. But here we're going to do it and we're going to sprinkle it around and we're going to mess it up. And it's going to connote something like that because it's still applause, but it's that's not the effect. Yeah. I can't remember whether it was because we wanted that effect or because it just happened to be there or it was accidental. Any of the above is possible. I'll suffice it to just have pointed at it and say, that's cool. That's, so, <laughs> all right. Well, I know we're reaching the end here. We wanted to touch as a way of sending you off on, you've mentioned a little about the early days, but you had picked out your first single from 1992, Ephemeral, by you were crediting yourself as Tic-Tac-Toe at the time. That's right. That's the first thing I ever made in the world. The artist's name was Tic-Tac-Toe. Uh, so it was the time of, around that time, it was like very do-it-yourself, rave music, very early beginnings of, I suppose, like drum and bass, jungle, hardcore, we used to call it here, with, you know, break beats and sort of reggae bass line influences, which was itself was being influenced by like house music coming from America and electronic music coming from the States and, and also like yeah, places like Belgium and the continent here in Europe. And I don't know, all this stuff was going on. It was a very exciting time. Raves, people starting up their own raves, not clubs, but like starting up their own like parties and fields without going through the proper channels or anything, you know, just like the people doing it for themselves sort of thing. Yeah, it was just a time of a lot of excitement. And it's on the radio, this is what you heard all the time. And I was in a band, I was in, um, I'd been in several bands, but I was in a kind of, I think I was in a, a funk band at the time. I played guitar in a funk band. But while this was going on, I had a little four track recorder and I used to, in my bedroom, I didn't have the equipment. I didn't know what sampler was. I didn't even know what MIDI was. I didn't know any of this stuff. So I used to kind of approximate what I was hearing on the radio and try and do something. And then um, I had some very, very good friends who were very supportive, encouraging of what I did. I'd play them what I'd done. They go, oh yeah, that sounds cool. So I'm about 21, 20, 21. And me and my friend take his mother's car and we go on a road trip down to France, from England down to France. And we have a great time, but unfortunately, halfway through, the car's broken into and they steal all our stuff. They don't steal the car, but they steal the car radio and they steal our bags and everything and our passports and anyway, blah, blah, blah. But off the back of that, my friend, who's a shrewd, clever guy, he got some insurance for that. And uh, I think he got a grand. And bless him, he says, we're going to put this money, when the money, the money came through, we're going to put this to releasing your first record. Totally encouraged me to kind of uh, release a record so... We knew that you had to have better equipment. We hired a sampler. We hired a keyboard. We hired a reel-to-reel. -reel. Up until now, all I'd had was a Fostex 4-track. I'd never worked with MIDI. For my demos, I would DJ beats from my decks. I would DJ beats onto the 4-track and then play, like, manually, play little, from a little, crappy little keyboard, play, like, bass lines or, you know, things. From that, I had to go. We hired this stuff. We got it from a, a rental firm, and we had it, like, for 24 hours, maybe even 12 hours. And my friend said, there you go. And I was surrounded by the stuff. I had no idea how to work any of it. it was, yeah, it was really stressful because that was, we also, we didn't have much money. We only had that money, which had to cover for the rental of the equipment and it had to pay for the future pressing of the vinyl because that's what people used to do. They used to press their own vinyl, basically. Mm -hmm. So you would bypass major labels. You had this culture of white labels because the 12 inches were white labels. They weren't proper printed labels. It was like just, it's how they come. So yeah, anyway, I, I did it. So it's very rough around the edges, this thing. It's really rough because it's recorded onto reel to reel by someone who doesn't know what they're doing and is frantically trying to get this thing that they've, they've sketched out in their bedroom and they're trying to, they've, for the first time, got like some quite high tech stuff and they're trying to kind of make this thing sound like a record. So it's really, really rough. It uses a reggae bass line and it's very ravey. It goes on a bit. I listened to it and it, it could definitely do with an edit. So if you're gonna if you're gonna play it, I say a minute's fine. Just go That's to the breakdown. That's why it's down. at the end. <laughs> That's fine, you know. But it brings back happy memories because it because it did well. It kind of I think people like the kind of um yeah the mastering engineer did a great job as well. He really and applause to mastering engineers because mm -hmm. they can really transform a recording. So I think what we gave him we went with our reel to reel machine. 
It would have been like quarter inch, I think. Was there a sequencer involved? Like, or was it just, it must have at least been a drum machine. You're not just hitting, you know, you're not creating a loop manually on the reel to reel. I would draw it out. I had an SR16, a Lisis SR16 drum machine. Mm-hmm. And I had a basic pattern on that, like a kick drum, not doing like a straight kick drum, like a sort of syncopated kick drum mm-hmm. and, and a hi hat. And I kind of wrote down how many bars I thought that it should go to break down. I did it like on mass paper, you know, squared mass paper. Sure. I used that. And I kind of, I remember because I was at college at the time and in my lunch breaks, I would map out how this track was going to go. And then on the drum machine, I programmed it. So it was an exact length. And then everything I did would go on top of that. Dr- that was my sequencer, basically. Okay. That was my click track. So I would record the drum machine. That was a locked thing. That was a locked structure, and it was a locked timing. But then the keyboard parts, even if they would recur, it's not like you... Well, you had the sampler, so you could just hit that every time it was supposed to come around. I played it. It wasn't triggered. I played it. I gave up on trying to sequence it. I didn't have Cubase or anything like that or any kind of... So it was literally... It was my drum machine, and then sounds like the bass sound was a sine wave coming from the sampler, Mm -hmm. and I just played the riff manually. So you can hear the riff... Uh, the bass lines and the riffs, they're all, the timing's very... That makes it very live. That's great. For, That's for, si- for six minutes, <laughs> standing there, playing it, trying to be robotic, but just <laughs> totally playing it. So it's all completely... And if you do that a few times, so the first time you play the bass line, it's kind of all right. And then you play something on top of it, and that's kind of, But it's like, a, it's like a tower that's wobbling, that's just holding together, you know? Well, that's a good reason for me to play the whole thing. Oh, I don't know if you should. Because I want to hear it all shaking around. I'd, I'd cut off the beginning <laughs> and cut off. The, it just goes on too long. But anyway, but the gist of it's cool. And anyway, as I was trying to say, it did well. It did well. We were surprised. You go to the factory, you pick up the records, and then we deliver them to uh, the dance record shops. There was loads at the time of independent, specifically house, jungle, hmm. uh, hip hop, you know, dance record shops in London especially around Soho in the West End of London. And you'd go there and you'd take your box of 25, maybe. It was 25 per box, I think. So maybe two boxes. They'd listen, well, they'd listen to it first and go, yeah, I'll take, we'll take a box, we'll take a box. And then you'd go back the next week and see if they'd sold any. Sale or return, it was called. Mm-hmm. And if they'd sold them, they'd give you, they'd give you the money. And, and that's how it went. And it, yeah, that was the first time. It was very exciting, very, very homemade, very DIY. But thanks to my friend, basically, for like, first of all, donating that insurance money. <laughs> to make to pay for all of it and also just giving me him and a couple of other friends who are just great encouraged me to kind of carry on so yeah well that's a fun little look into a interesting period in music history and yeah <laughs> doing business at that point thanks so much for doing this it was a it was a great treat talking to you i really enjoyed it nice to talk to you all right here it is ephemeral
Thanks so much to Simon. As longtime listeners know, I know almost nothing about EDM, house music, and so it was really a great pleasure spending time with Simon's catalog, and I hope to do much more in this area. For more information, please see basementjacks.com or look up uh, Village of the Sun on Bandcamp, because that sure is a nice album. The two interviews I still have in the can here are with Esther Ballant and Pat Irwin. Those will be excellent. Go to nakedlyexaminedmusic.com to make sure you are subscribed to get them promptly. I have thankfully had a little break in interviewing as I've had COVID for the past week or so, but am prepping for some very fun ones coming up. I want to remind you all, if you have suggestions for guests, maybe you even are a potential guest, feel free to email me at mark at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. I also want to invite you to follow the podcast on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The podcast has an Instagram account too, if you would rather follow that. All these will keep you up to date on the most current episodes. And you can even follow my Spotify playlist for Nakedly Examined Music, which will even tell you what I'm prepping for, as that is a constantly shifting document as I consider various songs for coverage on the podcast. Hope you're doing well. You have a great uh, holiday season. Keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Meyer signing off. <laughs>